Greetings and praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Brady, and tonight we have our Life Impact Bible Study of the New Bethel Church here in Kansas City, Kansas. We are a church that is controlled by the Spirit of God. Oh, we just concluded our SELA Enrichment Conference. It was awesome. The move of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Word that was brought forth, we are still rejoicing. Each night, the speakers delivered to us a rhema word, hallelujah, as we talked about the need of faith for an uncomfortable assignment. Pastor Chris Foster, Bishop Gwendolyn Weeks, and Pastor Cameron Adams all delivered a move of God through the word. Now, on the Saturday the actual day of the conference, we were blessed. And of course, if you were not here, it's hard to replicate. But I felt led to, for our Life Impact Bible study for the next four weeks, we're going to show each of the sessions that were presented. So if you were unable to be here for whatever the reason, we want you too to be blessed. May 22nd, we're hearing Pastor Derek Kirk. And then on May 29th, we're having Pastor Sherlina Celestine. And then on June 5th, we've got Elder Jonathan Banks. And then on the 12th of June, we concluded with a panel discussion. You'll hear all three of them. So I'm telling you, let the word be spread. Even if you were unable to attend the Life Impact Bible Study for the next four Wednesdays, we're going to share with you the presentations. I'm certain you too will be blessed. So let's move forward tonight and the next other three nights we have Life Impact Bible Study. God bless and please keep us in your prayers. Blessings, New Bethel. We are going to kick it into high gear. I have been tremendously blessed from afar and up close because many of you know that Bishop Brady has been a featured speaker at Bishop Smith's Faith Works Conference over the years. And so I have been a beneficiary of his wisdom, experience, and the grace over his life. I'm grateful for his family and for our other two speakers. I give God praise. Let's look to the Lord. If you would please bow your heads. Gracious God, our bellies are full, our hearts are rejoicing, but yet, God, we know that you have more. So we sit in anticipation, we sit with expectation, and we ask that your anointing would flow and connect these dots in our hearts so that destiny is unveiled today, God. In this Sila season, God, reveal strategies and insight for this next season of our lives collectively, individually, corporately, professionally, emotionally. God, do a miracle this afternoon. We thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God a praise, please, with me. Thank you. Please be seated. I'm just going to throw my phone on Do Not Disturb, make sure that all is well. And that just helps. So, this afternoon, for a brief time, we're going to talk about uncomfortable approaches for fueling and funding your ministry vision. You may say, Jonathan, I don't run a ministry. And my response to that says, your life is a ministry. And as we've heard from our other speakers, that our whole orientation must be kingdom-oriented and it must be vision fueled. So I'm Jonathan Banks. I am from Chicago, Illinois. See how we're doing here. Great. So I'm going to get out of the way. I'm not sure how well you can see my family up here. Uh, we're all JBs. I'm Jonathan. My wife's name is Jacinta. We've been married for 27 years. Uh, I stalked her at Purdue University. And God has been kind to us. 
We've been married 27 plus years, and, and you'll notice on the screen, I say that we're happily married because you'll know there is a difference between being married and happily married. And it's not throwing shade on anything. I believe that every marriage can be a happy marriage when we intentionally invest and we add preference and deference and exclusivity and all the things that add to marriage. God has blessed our marriage. We have two sons. Jonathan II is 23. Justin is 21. On the picture on your left, you'll see about 15 days ago, 16 days ago, our younger son, Justin, graduated college. He has a bachelor's degree in uh, information. Uh, I'm going to actually mess this up now. Uh, health studies. But the beauty of it is he's pre-med. And this fall, he is starting med school at the University of Chicago, Pritzker School of Medicine, on a full tuition scholarship. Let's give God praise. Yes. And in fact, Justin was accepted into a different med school before he finished high school. Our older son, Jonathan, was accepted into dental school before he finished high school. He got a perfect 36 on the ACT college entrance exam and is currently doing a dual doctorate degree, a PhD in oral sciences, and his dentistry degree, all fully funded because he received a $900,000 national institute your tax dollars and my tax dollars, but not my savings dollars, fully funded. He is to wish me to for, he is to reward me for, and he put money in his pocket every single month for seven years straight. I keep up here and just both sons worship, serve, and have 4.0 GPAs. After our session today, if you'd like, please avail yourself of a resource that we launched a few years ago called Raise Your GPA. Now, in Raise Your GPA, it stands for your grade point average and your God point average, the things that launch you greater into success in God. It's great for anyone 12 to 22, tweens, teens, and young adults. It will help them maximize and unlock destiny over their lives. These are the principles and practices that we experimented with on our sons, and the proof is in the pudding. When I was at Purdue University, Bishop Brady read a little bit of my bio. I have a Bachelor of Engineering from Purdue University. When I was at Purdue University, which, by the way, I got saved when I was 18 years old. The first time I ever remember being in church, I was 13 years old for my father's funeral. My father made very poor lifestyle choices in addition to smoking and diet and other things, and he passed away when I was 13 years old. That was the first time I remember ever being in church. And a young lady that I dated in high school, her mother made me come to church one time. And I don't remember what had happened between 13 and 18, but somehow God got my attention to know that there was something bigger that I had experienced. Yeah. Now, what I didn't tell you yet, and I know you're looking up here, the lights are very bright, and you're saying, wow, that guy looks kind of light. It's not just because of the lights. I'm actually by ethnic. And I use that word intentionally. I do not use the word biracial because I am persuaded that there's only one race of human beings on the planet. If you read the book of Acts, Paul said, of one blood, God made all of us. Race is a man-made construct to divide us and to bring conflict into the earth. There's only one race of human beings, but there are many ethnicities and cultures. My mother is first-generation German Jew. If you paid attention or didn't sleep through all of history class, you remember a dictator and a, uh, and a really a despot named Hitler who came to power in Germany in the late 30s. Uh, I am told that there were five boats that the last German Jews were able to leave Europe. And my grandparents, my mother's parents, were on one of those boats. One went to Australia, four came to the US, and here I am. So my mother and father met in Philadelphia. My sister and I share uh, the same parents. My parents split when I was five years young, and my mother goes back to the synagogue. Now, we are not the most devoted Jews. We are pork-eating Jews, if that makes any sense to you. (laughs) 
but I had a bar mitzvah, phonetically read Hebrew, I had a confirmation, but here I am at 18 knowing that there's more for me. And so I get to Purdue University and I must visit 10 churches. And to be quite honest, I didn't feel God in there one of them. And my lab partner in chemistry class, I don't even remember how God came up. But she says, why don't you come and worship with me? And I said, well, where do you worship? And she told me the name of it. And I said, well, I've already been there. She said, what time did you go? I said, well, the marquee out on the, on the front of the uh, lawn says 10 o'clock. She says, no, 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 come back at 2 o'clock. I'm like, what y'all doing at 2 o'clock over there? And I show up, and there was a young pastor there preaching Jesus, preaching love, connecting all the dots that I learned through my Judaic upbringing, connecting the fact that he is Emmanuel, he is God with us, and that he is in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you mean to tell me the God of the universe came and packaged his entirety in the person of Jesus, died for my sins, and rose triumphant on the third day, and the fact that he is the propitiation for my sins. He is the Passover lamb that I've been celebrating every year of my existence. That's the God that I want to serve. I was baptized in Jesus' name, got filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues that October, and that was 32 years ago in Jesus' name. I'm going to give God praise for my own testimony. But I just shared that with you because I want you to know who's up in front of you. Growing up, I wasn't black enough for the black kids. I was too dark for the white kids. Never felt like I fit in anywhere. But I, it's because I was always destined to fit into the kingdom. The kingdom is not race. The kingdom is not ethnicity. The kingdom of God is all those blood-bought believers that are willing to put down. And I loved what uh, Pastor Shalina said, or maybe it was Pastor Derek. He said that when God calls you, really, he call, faith means that you must lay down you. And I'm like, my God, faith means that I must sacrifice who I think I have been. Never enough. Now, I know many, some of you may not have stood on this stage. And I'm the only one standing right now. So you're not, you're not sure right now if I'm 5'5 five, five or 6'5. I'll tell you, I'm much closer to 5'5 five, five than I am to 6'5. In fact, when I was entering my freshman year of high school, the only thing I wanted to do was be five feet tall. I was always the one sitting crisscross holding the school sign in the pictures. So I always knew I was too short to be remembered, too light to be remembered, too dark to be remembered. My life did not matter. In fact, in my freshman year at Purdue, before God saved me, I took a suicide walk. Not because I wanted to die, but because I no longer wanted to live a meaningless life. And God got my attention and gave me a reason to hold on against hope, believe in hope, that my life could matter to somebody. And all that comes through and raise your GPA. It helps our kids understand their grade point average, the fact that it matters, that it will open up destiny for you and their God point average, that God creates them with intentionality. Now, if you've got a grade point, if you've got a God point average, you also have a devil point average. Things that try to pull you into bullying, negative social media, premature intimacy, cursing, and all the things that pull you away from God. In Raise Your GPA, we help 12 to 22 year olds understand their why Come on. And chasing after God in their best future. Yeah. Our mistake is that we expect young people to buy into old people's why. Yeah. And that never works. Yeah. Even in previous generations, the only reason that you we were able to catch more than we lost was because we didn't have the technological distractions that young people have now. Yeah. I read in Proverbs that if you train up a child in the way they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Here's the problem. We're not doing any training. All we're doing is telling. And you're like, Brother Banks, no, 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 no. I train my child. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you an example of how you know you're not. Because when your child messes up, you say, didn't I tell you it? 
How many times do I have to tell you? In that dumb blank stare, staring you back in the faces, yes, you told me, but you didn't train me. You did not equip me. You did not give me a reason for my why to buy into your truth. All you did was tell me you did not train me. We tell our young people to lift their hands, but we don't tell them why to lift their hands in ways that are meaningful to them. And yes, I've worked in youth ministry for over 32 years. I do have the privilege of sewing into international group of pastors through cohorts, training, online curriculum, downloadable PDFs at Urban Outreach Foundation. I have the privilege of serving as a chief operating officer, and that was done intentionally because one of our client partners, Together Chicago, where we serve over 170 churches in this city, I also serve as chief operating officer of that organization as well. Okay, you know, when you serve God, he will give you a Joseph anointing of administration where you can have multiple areas of impact and influence. And that's why I'm here at the CELA conference. So let's just unpack some strategies and principles. I believe that God always gives vision with provision. That's not news to anyone here. I know Bishop Brady has probably taught that trillions of times. But what we want to talk about is fueling God's vision through a culture of collaborative faith. By the way, every word on every slide is intentional. There are no fillers here. We're talking about fueling God's vision through a culture of collaborative faith. You all know Ephesians 4, 9. It says two people are better than one of them. Better off than one for they can help each other succeed. I believe that God is calling for success in 2024. Yes, we have a testimony. Yes, we are armed with the truth of the gospel. Yes, we have the sword of the spirit and all of the armor of God. But what will become attractive to the world is when you walk in kingdom destiny and your life becomes fruitful or successful. There's got to be something in your life that is attractive to other people. God told Israel that I will spark you to jealousy by how good I am to the Gentiles, and I am living proof. The reason my heart was open to the gospel was because I saw joy in people that were not Jewish, trusting God, and I said, I want to know more about that God. And I would implore you not to fall into the trap to think that Jewish people have anything better than anybody else. Yes, God chose them to bring forth his truth and the Messiah through him, but Paul says we are now of two, God has made one, and we are now children of God, we are heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, our elder brother, because we have been adopted into the family of God with full rights and privileges. Two are better than one. So I apologize for the, the fine print. I'll read a little bit of it. Now, there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of engineering on a Saturday afternoon. So this is where if you ate a little bit too much and then you knew you were full, but you ate that cookie anyway, I need you to sit up a little bit further in your chair. There was a gentleman by the name of Isaac Newton. He did not invent these laws. These are God-given principles that he discovered. All your cell phones right now, by the way, they communicate through microwaves that nobody invented. We discovered them. Now we're leveraging them to connect and communicate with people. But Newton discovered that an object at rest remains at rest and an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. Which means if you ain't doing nothing, you're going to continue to do absolutely nothing until God grabs a hold of your heart. But if you are courageous, if you are dauntless, if you are just 
birth in your spirit, a drive to please God. And if you are courageous enough to set prayer in motion and to set feet to your prayers, God will accelerate your kingdom momentum and you will be a force to be reckoned with. So what is a force? A force is the acceleration of an object. It does depend on the mass of the object and the amount of force applied and that whenever one object exerts a force on another object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. What does all that mean to us today? That means that as God is planting seeds of faith, seeds of hope, as he's downloading strategies and insight and giving you wisdom, it doesn't matter if you're in your 20s or in your 80s, God's seasoned intentionality will open up heaven's windows and doors over your life with these strategies today. Now, I did not come to Kansas City to talk about pain. But you all brought up this season of uncomfortable growth. And I'm looking at this precious child here. And by the way, what is your grandson's name? Dawson. Dawson. Dawson is how old? Four months. Okay, four months in a day. Does, does Dawson have tummy time? He has to have tummy time, right? Because if not, the neck muscles won't strengthen appropriately. He won't be able to hold his head up. Now, the first time you placed Dawson on his tummy, was he happy? Where's mama? She just stepped out. I can guarantee you, because all of us that have had babies, every time you put a baby on his tummy for the first time, the baby will start to cry and struggle because those neck muscles are not strengthened enough. But unless you allow that child to struggle right there and for those muscles to strengthen, you will retard that child's growth and you will impact their development. Now, I think it's pretty audacious for a man to be up on stage talking about labor and birth pains. As if I have ever come even close to whatever that is. So I'm going to tell you what I heard, not what I know about labor pains. <laughs> but every pain has purpose. Purpose to keep you, purpose to jettison you forward in destiny. Purpose. Understand that we are talking today about birthing vision and ministry and business and collect connection, collaboration. Understand that we're undergoing individual and collective growing pains. Again, I'm not even a physician. I get lightheaded at the sight of blood, which is why my sons are health professionals and I'm not. <laughs> and by the way, since they were in sixth and seventh grade, my sons were in somebody's doctor's office, dentist's office, clinic, somewhere where they could be around health professionals so that they could see, is this something that appeals to you? Yeah. Don't allow your sons and daughters to make career decisions unless they have shadowed at least two different professionals in that profession on at least two separate days. Any college will sell you a piece of paper, but you've got to try the spirit by the spirit and pray and say, God, I've experienced this. This is resonating with me. And then like Pastor Derek said, you must be ambiguous. Say, God, and if you push me in this direction, I'll go. But if you don't, I'm good, God. But I'm told that from the ages of early teens, even through late teens, sometimes that there will be these pains that children experience in their joints and legs called growing pains. Obviously, you can see I didn't have a lot of growing pains. I'm kind of concentrated, like Zacchaeus. I didn't say short, I said, I said concentrated. And then of course, Pastor Derek and I were trading running stories yesterday. He's a runner, I'm not. Uh, I did finish the Chicago Marathon in 2018 and 2019, 26.2 miles. You understand the value of stretching. That if you're going to strengthen a muscle, it pays to stretch that muscle out and condition it. And you're letting that muscle know that, hey, 
greater is coming. It may not be comfortable right now, but greater is coming. Stronger is coming. It may feel weak right now, but stronger is coming. And we stretch muscles with anticipation and hope of what God is going to do. And of course, this is not my concept. I heard it one time repeated by Tony Robbins, who, you know, I listen to a lot of people. And yes, even though I do keep a plant-based diet, I know how to chew fish and spit bones, even though I haven't had fish in 12 years. But he said there are two types of pain. There's the pain of disappointment, I'm sorry, the pain of discipline, or the pain of regret. And you make a choice of which type of pain you want to have. You cannot have a pain-free life. You cannot have a comfortable life. That is not how we're designed. The Bible says the man is born of a woman, but a few days and full of discomfort. Full of pain. But you must make a choice. Do you want the pain of discipline? Or do you want the pain of regret? I could make an argument, but if you are over the age of five years old, you know right now the pain of regret is always greater than the pain of discipline. The pain of discipline is momentary. The pain of regret, if not given to God, can be decades. Again, I did not know the exact size of the screen. I apologize. I know that there are some church leaders in this room. So I want, if you're a church leader, you could, should look through the lens of the eyes of your church. But if you are a business leader, a family leader, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a solopreneur, if you're an intrapreneur, if you're a wannabe preneur, if you're a side entrepreneur, <laughs> understand these trends. In churches, primarily in America, we know that online giving is the number one way that people tithe and give to churches. Smaller donations, less than $250, and this is an annual donation, by the way. Annual donation. They have increased almost 20% from 2020 and beyond. So that means that there are more people giving in and connected to churches than before. Many churches saw their finances increase during the pandemic because God got their attention. They were willing to turn on a screen for 45 minutes to an hour and a half on a particular day. And by the way, 2020 accelerated asynchronous discipleship. Synchronous means it's all happening at the same time. You all remember synchronous swimming? All of the swimmers swimming and doing their dancing moves at the same time? Asynchronous means it's happening at different times, which means that Bishop Brady can preach heaven down to earth at 10 o'clock on Sunday, and the anointing is still flowing on Tuesday morning when someone in Chicago is streaming that service through their phone. Seventy-five to ninety percent of church members do not tithe. Bishop Brady said he was doing some math earlier. What does that tell you? That tells you that not only are between ten and twenty-five percent of the people holding the burden of financial support for churches, but it also lets you know that there are. There are untapped givers that are waiting for a better understanding of kingdom financing in our churches. Which means that while we must continue to teach about kingdom stewardship, we have to reevaluate, is my message on kingdom stewardship connecting with the why of those untithing members? Again, not my definition. I've been told that the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over again, expecting different results. So while I will maintain my specific giving message, 
for those 10 to 25% of the members that have caught God's vision, and I will supplement it with another message that can connect with a broader audience. Now, I told you only 10 to 25% of people are tithing. Of those 10 to 25% of people that are currently tithing, 77% of them give between 11 and 20% of their income into the church. And that is a healthy benefit. I believe in biblical tithing. I believe that not only is a tenth, but the first tenth belongs to God. And then, of course, we give freely on top of that. 64% of donors say that establishing trust is essential before donating. And in America, 32% of American volunteers choose to volunteer for their church or religious groups, which also means, remember, trust is never given. We unpack this in Raise Your GPA, and your child needs to understand how to use trust. Trust is never given. It's always earned. Anyone that says, trust me, does not understand trust because trust is earned. And by the way, once trust is broken, trust can never be rebuilt. It can only be built again. The fibers of trust, the connected blocks of trust, once torn apart, can never be fused back together again. But trust can be built again, starting block by block. It can be accelerated. It can be emphasized. But once trust is broken, it cannot be rebuilt. It must be built again. So if you do see a lack of giving, you must also investigate, is there a lack of trust? If your clients for your business are not growing, I would encourage you to examine, have you earned the trust of your customers and clients? Sometime today, perhaps we may sell our 17,000 copy of Raise Your GPA, depending on how many of the copies that you all buy. <laughs> But I'll tell you that I have not sold one copy of Raise Your GPA without first earning the trust of that buyer. Mm -hmm. And for every aspiring author in the place today, I would reveal this truth to you. People buy you before they buy your book. Right. If there's nothing attractive about your life, if there's nothing that catches their attention, nothing they want to emulate, then why would they want more of what they've already seen unless they buy it and believe? Let's accelerate where we're going today. So today I'm going to talk about updating our ministry fueling model and mindset. Remember that tithes and offering leverages mature Christians leaving new or less committed members on the sidelines. And you can give that same giving message appeal. You can make it three minutes or you can make it 30 minutes. It does not matter if they trust you, they'll give. If they don't, they won't. We have to ask ourselves a question. How do we engage our entire congregation and community? And my brothers and sisters, I submit to you that we will do that through the power of partnership and collaboration. So we train our church right now to fund vision instead of fueling vision. There is this dichotomy where we separate those that do ministry from those that receive ministry. And that was never God's plan for his church. We want people to fund the ministry instead of fueling it. Understand that people are more likely to financially support efforts that they are involved in versus merely believe in. Come on now. It's the difference as a leader in saying, go ahead, versus saying, come on with me. 
You all have heard this definition before, I'm sure, if not, you can write it down, it's profound, it's not mine. It may be a quote from Bill Hyams, who was a megachurch pastor in Chicago, incredibly successful, like too many of our leaders has had some very significant character and reputation challenges, but this truth was still a truth. He said, vision is a picture of a preferred future. It's the picture of a preferred future. That's vision. Fueling your vision invites the congregation and community into collaboration versus consumerism. And you can translate that to your business, to your school, or you come to your family. Mm -hmm. All of us have family. You're someone's son or daughter. You're someone's, doesn't matter if you've been orphaned, you've got a big mama in your life, you got somebody in your life that cares about you. Yeah. And too often we try to do for them instead of with them. Yeah. Yeah. For them is service and it's godly. With them, that's kingdom. That's acts. House to house, breaking bread, fellowship. Text this to yourself, write yourself a note, tweet it, put it on X, threads, whatever you got. Passion is infectious. You know what else is infectious? Apathy. In fact, in fact apathy is not just infectious, it's insidious. This is free. Uh, I'm not charging Bishop Brady for this one. <laughs> Many of us just say, well, well, Jonathan, give me some time. I just want to take baby steps. And I say, God bless you. Take your baby steps. Just don't expect giant results from baby steps. Okay. Well, baby steps will get you every time. You know why it's okay if babies fall? They're already close to the ground. Somehow let that stare at you for just five more seconds. So my question to you is your, your family model, your business model, your business, how healthy is your ministry model? How healthy. You've heard that God will open up doors that no man can shut, that he will call you from the closet of obscurity, and he will place you on a global platform. You've heard that it won't be comfortable. You've heard that God has more for you, and that he'll take you from faith to faith, but God operates through structures, through systems, and through models, and he will only birth what is come to the fullness of time when we have developed healthy systems, healthy models. So do you do ministry for your church or do you do ministry with your church? Do you treat your pastor like a hireling or do you treat her or him like your God-given leader and that God always blesses through proximity? I'm going to put the clicker down and tell you a Bishop Wagner story. I get to Chicago in 1996. I have, I just got saved in 1991. My problem is I was curious and I believed you. If you told me that God was a healer, I believed you. You told me that God was a way maker, I believed you. You told me that God would open up doors, I believed you. And I chased hard after God. And when I ran the tutoring center at Purdue University, I used it as my mission field. Because when people walked in, they were not just hurting academically, they were hurting spiritually, they were hurting emotionally. And I would always run to the leaders at Purdue and I would have the hardest of the hard questions. And they told me later, they said, Jonathan, when we would see you coming, we would like find somewhere else to be. And we would try to hide because we knew that you weren't playing around with your questions. And so I served under Bishop Ronald Young in Pennsylvania. And he said, when you move to Chicago, because I graduated Purdue with a food process engineering degree, and I went to work for the number one food company in the country, Kraft Foods at the time. And I did things to food that no one should ever do to food in the name of profit, shareholder value, 
and, and money. And I have repented and God has forgiven me. And perhaps one day you will too. But my love language uh, is acts of kindness. So I'm always trying to serve. And I was only in our church for a quick moment of time before they allowed me to begin to serve. And in 1996, when was our last harvest convention, we invited, I'm pretty sure, Bishop Norman Wagner, who, in my mind, there were giants in Pentecost. And then there was Bishop Norman Wagner. <laughs> Bishop Wagner was like no one else I had ever met in my entire life. And he opened up doors and faith, understanding in ways that has blessed me the next 32 years. And I've been assigned to be Bishop Wagner's adjutant in Chicago. And I go and I go to this hotel. And I get in the hotel, and he and I get in the hotel, we're going down to the basement. And he turns around, and he looks at me. He says, and I would do my Bishop Wagner impression, but I'm in front of Bishop Brady, and I know that my impression would fail miserably, so I'm just going to say it in my own voice. When I tell the story elsewhere, I try to do my Bishop Wagner impression. I'm not going to do that in front of Bishop Brady. Oh, no, no, it's bad. It's, it's like I, I have not spent enough time around him. But he looks at me, Bishop Brady, and he says, is this what you want? And, I'm, and uh, number one, I'm a little scared. Because he told me he just came from wherever. He's just going to wherever. I know God's got his hand on him. I know his life is not his own. And he turns to me and he says, is this what you want? And if I could be quite honest, in my spirit, I said, no, not really, Bishop. <laughs> but I didn't answer him verbally. I don't think he was expecting expecting an answer. I'm not even sure that he was conscious that God was using him to ask me a question which I now interpret as, are you willing to trust me? Do you want to live a yielded life? Do you want to live a God-led life? And for God to use you uniquely as you are, that yes, you are dark enough. Yes, you are light enough. Yes, you're even tall enough, Jonathan, for God to use you just as you are. And as God has taken me to, I don't know, 25, 30 countries, allowed me to preach in places like Kenya and Grenada and Malawi and, and places that I, I did very poorly in, in, in geography in high school. Places I probably couldn't even find on map. And again, it's not about God using you in several locales with geographies. Don't allow us to have assignment comparison. Oh, I As if God loves people in the UK more than he loves them in Mexico City. God does not have favorites. We're the ones that artificially pump up different geographies. Yeah. But if we go and visit, you'll find that people are people. Yeah. So Bishop Wagner looks at me and he says, is this what you want? And in that one question, he read my theology, he read my life plan. And now I have to continue to ask God, God, what do you want for my life? I'm going to pick up my little clicker now. Are our ministry models healthy? When we do ministry for our church, it invites criticism and disconnection. I know y'all already read my slide, but if I wouldn't do it like that. I wouldn't have had her sing that song. You know, I wouldn't have put them over that committee. That's what we ask for when we do ministry for our church. When we do ministry with our church, people bring their energy, their ideas, their friends, and their money. This is why we have to do ministry with people. You have to be willing to let people into ministry that you may deem as less spiritually minded than you. Yes, their life may be raggedy in areas that are different than the areas that your life is raggedy in. 
and we cannot be the raggedy police. I don't have a raggedy app on my iPhone and say, oh, no, 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 your area of raggediness. We can't use you, but we can use your area of raggediness. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. Just like when we raise our children, if we do everything for them, when they grow up, they will be incompetent adults. They will not be contributing members of society. They will have appreciation. But if you do laundry with your young people, you do dishes with your young people, they don't work for you. They are part of this family. We do things together. That's how we win as a family. I'm going to digress for a quick second. Because I try to, if Bishop Wagner taught me nothing, is to be sensitive and obedient to the Spirit. It's incredibly intentional now. Remember, when we grew up, if my father was a plumber, I do not need to go on a 40 day fast, go out to Mount Moriah, and lay before God and say, What would I do with my life? My name is Jonathan Banks. If I was a plumber, it would be Banks and Sons Plumbing. Yeah. Yeah. Because as my, if my son was whole, old enough to hold a wrench, he would begin to hold that wrench differently. He would have proficiency. He would have excellence and skill. Things that would take average people two hours to do, he would be able to do it in two minutes. He would be a plumber that you hire. In my house, I do 90% of the plumbing, but you would not hire me to do plumbing in your house. Why? Because I usually break something else before I fix the original thing. And I'm slow. I got a big old house. Thankfully, I got multiple sinks and multiple showers because that thing may be down for a week. And thank God my wife does not leave me. Only, you know, this trend started in Europe, but now it's going around to the world. We have outsourced education. We send our kids elsewhere to be educated. And I do believe in education. I believe in our educational system, but we have outsourced it. I believe in Deuteronomy 6. Teach these things diligently to your children. It's not the pastor's job to disciple your child. It is not the youth leader's job to disciple your child. It is your job to disciple your child. Our problem is we can't even disciple ourselves. We don't know the tennis of the We can't leave the basics of the doctrine, like Hebrew says, because we don't know the basics of the doctrine. So we have to then become disciples. We have to then humble ourselves and pastor. Teach me again so I can teach my son and daughter. The pastor can reaffirm, can affirm, but it's our responsibility. So fast forward now, we do, you know, we let our sons and daughters get to be 18, and then we ask them one of the stupidest questions you ever ask anyone in the entire world. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> Excuse me, Bishop, it's a dumb, stupid question. <laughs> and we mean well. And then we lie to them. Child, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. Knowing is not true. Somewhere I read in the Bible, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. God created you with intentionality and thoughts. God told Jeremiah before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. How are you going to ask a four, a 14, a 16 year old, what do you want to be when they've got no clue what's going out in the real world? I'm going to tell my age here now. My freshman year at Purdue University, that's when the internet became open to everything, prolific. Which means that as I was growing up, if you would ask me, what do you want to be? I couldn't tell you an app developer. Because there were no such thing as applications. <laughs> applications that are shortcut to websites. There were no such thing as websites because there was no such thing as the internet because for most of us, there was no such thing as a computer. And... For everyone in this room that influences children under the age of 18, over half of the careers that they compete in, write that word down, compete in, they don't exist yet because their generation has not invented them yet. So you're asking them a question about a snapshot in time that is evolving faster than it ever has in the history of mankind. Technological advances, psychological advances, physiological advances. We are 
for our benefit and for our detriment to let them modify anything we can get our hands on. And you need to the five year olds to know what God's going to do in their life. So instead of asking them, what do you want to be? And ask them, where has God gifted you? Right. Usually they will tell you, I don't know yet. And that is the most perfect answer. Because then you say, well, let's discover it together. Let's pray and seek God. And ask God to open up your mindset. Ask Him, where and why do people seek you out? What problems do you solve? Because that's a clue to what God's going to do in your life all in this season. But we can't bottle that up because when we were growing up, we were comfortable having one area of competencies. Young people today must be have multiple areas of competency. They can't afford to be great at math and poor communicators. They can't be great at science, but not understand geography. They have to be holistically blessed. It doesn't matter if you are naturally curious or you could not care less about school. Most of us, the reason that they're not curious is because we have not sparked their intellectual nor academic curiosity. We're not reaching them. They come as empty slates. Kids come here as moldable clay. But we're the geniuses that push a screen in front of their face the second that they're born to pacify them instead of allowing them some uncomfortable moments. And again, anywhere where you see the word ministry, feel free to put your business, family, etc. What does fueling your ministry look like? Remember, we're talking about the difference between funding your ministry and fueling your ministry. Funding is temporary and is episodic, which means that if putting on lunch for today's uh, conference today took $3,000, if you all want to eat next Saturday, it will cost another $3,000. But if we fuel it, and next week you bring the sandwiches, and you bring the soup, and you bring the cookies, now we have fueled our ministry, we have reduced our cost, and we have brought up Involved it. And then when I told you, people, when they feel involved, yes, sir. Guys, yes. keep it already. I may have missed it. Yes. Oh, we. I messed it. Oh, I'm pushing my clicker the wrong way. Sorry, y'all. Oh, where did we go? Oh, there it is, the bottom. When you do people with your ministry, people bring their energy, their ideas, their friends, and their dollars. When you do ministry with, when you do family with your family members, when you do business with your community, that's when they bring their thing. So again, fueling your ministry looks like this. Visions and dreams. You all know Joel. You all know Acts. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Sons, daughters, old men, young men, old ladies, young ladies. God's vision and dreams are always multi-generational. They are intergenerational. Multi means more than one. Inter means connected. While I don't have any revelation from God, I am spiritually curious if the visions and dreams that all, all demographics are seeing are just a different view of the same picture. That your dream is not different than my vision. They're just different levels of clarity and different lengths of vision. If I'm in my golden senior season, I may see the future with more clarity than you do. But if you're in a younger season, you may see longer and farther than I do. And that's okay because we're looking at the same vision, but we're doing it in an interconnected way. Wow. Yeah. Fueling your mission looks like multiple demographics, multiple ethnicities, multiple ages. It Fueling your ministry incorporates corporate and community partners. New Bethel can't transform this community by itself was never designed to. It was designed to be a catalyst. It was designed to be a backbone organization, to pull together resources from around the community and then push forward God's agenda. You all know that many for-profit companies are looking for connections to their communities through churches and nonprofits. They're doing that right now. They're looking for your business. They're looking for your church. They're looking for your family. And because God is the source, churches should be a conduit 
in addition to a reproducer of blessings and equipping moments. When the world comes in contact with New Bethel and all the churches, they will do like Pastor Selena says. They will recognize the anointing, even if they can't identify it, they will recognize it. And in heaven, God gets the glory. And New Bethel and your ministry and your family and your business gets a ministry momentum and kingdom in that. Remember earlier when I warned you about Newton's laws of physics, that an object in motion tends to stay in motion and that's acted on by an outside force. There is nothing that beats ministry momentum. Once about word of mouth, noise means these things abroad. Once about people coming curious and open and broken and open to the gospel. That happens when you have ministry momentum. Touching the community in ways that are meaningful to them. Not just coming what we want, we're willing to meet you at the point of your need. In fact, if you ever look up Jim B's dictionary, the definition of ministry is meeting a need. If a need has not been met, then ministry has not gone forward. In our final moments, ministry momentum and acceleration. Oops, sorry, I made the wrong button. So, I have the privilege, Bishop, uh, when I joined Urban Outreach Foundation, rotated off as church staff. Well, really, Bishop Smith will say I, I rotated off as paid staff. I'm still unpaid staff. And every leader at AFC is on staff. You're either on paid staff or unpaid staff. And there are way more of us on unpaid staff than there are on paid staff. Because that's the kingdom model. Again, we're not just trying to pay people to do kingdom work. In fact, many of us that are hybrid, we have even greater impact because we continue to touch the needs of the people. So, but when I was on staff and when I led as the ministry director at AFC, we opened up our food distribution, but we didn't do it by ourselves. We were in partnership with an organization called Top Box Foods. And now we operate with the Chicago, Greater Chicago Food Depository. And we are a preferred vendor, which means that the food that is given away is given away through AFC. God gets the glory. The people's needs are met. And the government sees AFC as a willing partner. We have our own legal clinic at Apostolic Faith Church. It is brought together by the organization that is our client that I also serve as the chief operating officer of, Together Chicago, and an organization called the Justice Journey Alliance. But no one in the community knows the name Together Chicago, nor Justice Journey Alliance. It's Apostolic Faith Church has a legal clinic that will help you when you're in trouble. Needs being met, ministry going forward, collaboration, ministry with, not for, Involvement. You all know that my pastor is a medical doctor. He's the pediatrician, oncologist, uh, hematologist. He's a blood doctor with babies, studying sickle cell and thalassemia. He's representing the United States on international levels. He's from the Chicago Board of Health. He's always the smartest person in the room. Walgreens distributes vaccines through our church. But most of you don't know that Walgreens is there. I got my vaccine at AFC, Apostolic Faith Church. We've adopted schools. We bring clean water to developing countries through our partnership with World Vision. We do a holiday twin flesh where we connect with the gospel radio station. But yet we serve 15 shelters in the city, battered women's shelters, men's shelters, homeless shelters, and they all receive toys and gifts they only know AFC. They don't know iHeartRadio. They don't know the radio station. They just know that we are doing this in the name of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus, because we care about them individually. We've had people that were living at shelters. The next year they came back and volunteered to help others when God put them back on their feet. And I told you I celebrated Passover all growing up, uh, there's a friend of mine that had Jerusalem Advantage Tours. I partnered with her to do a Seder experience at our church for years. 
Sometimes we have as many as 300 people participate in our Seder experience, where we bring the parallels of the Passover and, of course, Jesus' sacrifice in the Last Supper so that people get a more culturally appropriate understanding of what was accomplished at the Last Supper and at Calvary. And there are Jews that have been connected to our church that uh, one time they asked me, said, do you believe in Jews for Jesus and Messianic Jews? And I leaned and I said, every true Jew is a Messianic Jew. They just either believe the Messiah has come or is coming. And I tell them, he's not only come, but he's living inside of me right now. He can live inside of you. His name is Jesus. If you read Isaiah 12, 2, I believe it is. It says, behold, Jehovah has become my salvation. That is the word Yahweh. Yahweh has become my salvation. Jesus means Jehovah has become my salvation. Yeah. That God, the God of the Bible. So I'm going to leave you with these questions. And these questions are designed not to make you uncomfortable, but to help you tap into this comfort that I hope that you are already feeling. So the questions, of course, are on the screen. They say, is your church stuck? Is your family stuck? Is your life stuck? Fueling your vision always builds on kingdom momentum and that you only fuel with collaboration. Remember the scripture we start out with, Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. King James says they have a greater reward for their labor. I feel like our gifted vessel from the UK, King James says, so you are. Who reads King James? Do they even speak King James English in UK right now? Probably not. It's probably evolved. But still, new King James. There you go. Right, remember, you know what the old saints used to say? If the King James Version was good enough for Peter, uh, Paul, and James, it's good enough for us. That's a little biblical humor. You'll get that a little later. Fuel your vision. Don't fund your vision. Fuel it. Fuel your vision. Bishop said I had until 2.45, so we're going to spend two minutes just praying over the vision that God has given us. And I'm going to believe God for a supernatural release. And I want you to even open your heart right now to those painful parts that you believe God spoke to you. And whether or not you discerned his voice properly, I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is, if it was God, it's got to come to pass. And if you heard him clearly, I want you to allow God to resurrect that vision in your heart. Because God, it is impossible for God to lie. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? He will do it. He'll do it because you're willing to fuel the ministry, not fund it. Fund it is worldly. Fueling it is kingdom. So let's believe God for those areas in our lives. I'm going to lead the prayer. You all are going to pray with me. I'm not praying for you. I'm just leading, which means if I flow in the spirit, that's just me interceding in the spirit and just asking God. I don't understand everything. And that is so key because who are we to think that we perfectly understand the mind and will of God? I'm not saying that you have to be flashy. You've got to speak like anyone else. But the Bible says that in the spirit, we unveil mysteries through groanings and utterings that we cannot understand. And that our spirit is built up. So let's just take this moment and just pray over these visions. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for opening up our understanding to fuel your work, your will, your way. God, we are thankful for this posture of uncomfortability. We thank you, God, to know that the vision is bigger than any one of us or any one organization. We thank you, oh God, that through kingdom collaboration and kingdom partnership, you are opening up doors of opportunity and resource. You are the source, and we thank you for connecting us with resources. 
There is nothing that can hinder your vision. Your hand is not short. Your arm is not short that it cannot save. Your ear is not heavy that it cannot hear, God. You are a provider. You are the way. You are way maker. God, you are opening up doors of resource, opportunity, financing over this congregation over this city, over the nonprofits that are represented in this space. And God, right now, we repent from having small-minded thinking. We say that we are sorry for limiting our faith and action. And God, we pray that you would renew our minds, that you would renew our hearts, that you would create in us a clean heart, and that you would renew a right spirit, a right kingdom mindset, a fueling mindset, God. Do a miracle in our hearts. God, resurrect dead dreams. Resurrect dead vision, oh God. The vision shall speak. It is for an appointed time. Oh God, you're going to bring it to pass. We will be diligent about writing it down. We will be diligent, oh God, about sharing your love with a hurting generation. In the name of Jesus, God bless Bishop Brady. Oh God, bless his leadership team. Bless New Bethel, God. Bless everyone connected to this ministry. Sons and daughters that have been birthed and sent. God, raise up kingdom champions. Oh God, interconnect generations. Let our young people excel spiritually and academically and professionally. Allow them to know this because of your anointing and the sacrifice of those that have labored in ministry, God. But this is our season to prosper. This season of rest, restoration, rebuilding, reconnection. God, you're planting seeds of prosperity that shall bring spring forth. Do it in the name of Jesus. I want you to pray for your family right now. Call their names out. In the name of Jesus. Over Jacinta, over Jonathan, over Justin. Over my mother Helen, oh God. My stepfather Harry, do it God in the name of Jesus. Over generations, over friends, over girlfriends, boyfriends, relationships. Do it Jesus. Hallelujah. Shotobo se atarama God, you're doing it right now. God, draw others. God, create in us a clean heart. Oh, God, do it now. Do it now, God. Repair relationships. Mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, God. Heal marriages in the name of Jesus. Open up doors, God. Cleanse us. Help us, God, for your glory and praise. Come on, join me in giving God a great ovation. Lord, we celebrate you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus.